So quite frankly, I don't know what this episode title is supposed to be a direct reference to because the movie that it parodies is a film released in 1979 known as The Warriors. But the title is worded to refer to something else entirely. The Long Skate Home. Yeah, I don't know. This could either be referencing the long road home, the long walk home, the long voyage home, although I really doubt it was referencing that one because that one's about a boat ride, or one of the many different stories titled The Long Way Home. Regardless, none of these refer to the movie that the episode is parodying, so it looks like we have another You're a Good Man Mojo Jojo situation on our hands. It also doesn't help that the characters aren't trying to get home. Why the hell was the episode named this? But judging by the word skate, I'm sure that you can guess that, yep, we've got another Derby Taunts episode on our hands here. Joy. At least, thankfully this time it's nowhere near as terrible as Derby Dollies, I can say that right off the bat. I still don't like Malin as a character though, and this episode doesn't change anything, but I'll get into that more as the episode unfolds. <laughs> Keep up, Bowhead. I don't want to be late for the Death Ball State of Smash address. The episode begins with a POV videotape recording of Blossom entering the underground secret hideout of all Death Ball teams with the Derby Taunt so that she can get as much footage as possible for a school report that she's doing on the subject of Death Ball. Hey, I'm glad we're given a good reason for why Blossom would be interested in this subject because otherwise I'd question what she was even doing here. She's never had any interest in Death Ball even when Bubbles was forced to have it. Also, as another example of proof that these seasons take place in a continuous timeline, Bubbles is a member of the Derbytons here, just like Buttercup, so this episode definitely has to take place after Derby Dollies did. It is here where we are presented with a brand new aspect of Death Ball culture. We discover a variety of different teams, their way of life, and one of the dumbest rules I've ever heard in my life. Apparently, according to the regulations established by those who play Death Ball, if you get tagged even once while you're within the Death Ball hideout's boundaries, you are permanently banned from playing Death Ball for life. I think I can handle a few dodgeballs. Death Balls! And if you get hit with one of those here, you're out! FOREVER! So you can't play Death Ball ever again? That's a stupid rule. I mean, Blossom's right, it is a very stupid rule. What good does this rule do for anybody? And why would anyone even want to go down into the secret hideout if it means risking never being able to play again? What's the fucking point? I'll just stay up above ground. Whatever, if they want to take that risk, that's their call. Speaking of, the reason that it even got brought up in the first place was because Blossom accidentally ran into one of the Grease Monkeys, one of the many different Death Ball groups present in the arena. And we are introduced to this leader of the team, Tess, who threatens Blossom. Although, here's a loophole in this whole never play again rule. Blossom isn't a Death Ball player to begin with, so getting tagged virtually means nothing to her. It's a completely empty threat, so really, she has nothing to worry about. Now, I don't know if Blossom tagging somebody else is allowed in the rules or if it's not specified, but theoretically, I feel like she has more power than anybody else here. Just saying. Anyways, in comes the Death Ball president, overlord, ringleader, whatever you want to call her, who's basically just here to provoke a change in the rules. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, my mains are Captain Falcon, Yoshi, Ness, and Dark Samus. Although, I do have some second tier characters like Wolf, Pokemon Trainer, Roy, Ike, Ganondorf, Lucas, Kirby, and Mewtwo. I used to play Mario, Sheik, Toon Link, and DK a bit, but not so much anymore once Ultimate came out. And Terry is really starting to grow on me. Oh, wait, that's not what she was referring to? Look, it's better than me interpreting the meaning of the word smash another way. I'll just say that. Now, see, everybody loves this chairperson, lady, because death ball culture is grounded in the belief that no matter how absurd, how stupid the rules are, they should never be changed because it's just the way it is. Amendments don't exist to them. That's how it's always been. That's how it always should be. A very, 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 very poor mindset to have, if you ask me. Just because something is tradition doesn't mean it should be broken. That's a terrible mindset to have. Just because something is tradition does not mean it is beneficial. And that's what this episode is trying to say in the end. 
so I have no issues there. But this ringleader announces that she's going to invoke a change, a decree that catches everybody off guard, including the Derbytons. Blossom just so happens to be filming all of this, conveniently, and she notices that the Grease Monkey's leader is lurking in the shadows when she suddenly throws a death ball at their leader and knocks her out. So basically, the reboot just gave us its take on an assassination attempt. Interesting. Never thought the reboot would get this medal, but Hey! Blossom flies over to Tess and calls her out on what she just did, although she quickly turns the tables on them and announces to everybody that the Derbytons did it. I saw you! <gasps> the Derbytons! They did it! They took out Smash Lee! <gasps> what? She's lying! Are you no, lying? Yes. On what basis? Is anybody here going to ask for proof that they did it? Hard evidence. Other witnesses. How does Tess here have more say in the matter than anybody else? She is just as much of a suspect as Blossom, as the Derbytons. Blossom is literally holding a video camera. She can just say to the whole room that she caught what happened on tape just a second ago, and everybody can work together to find a VCR player to play it and prove who the real culprit is. And if Tess were to have any objections to this, that would only make her more suspect than she already is. Oh, and yes, for some reason, in this episode, in this episode alone, never again in the entire series, Blossom is using a VCR recorder instead of her phone or a digital camera. Why that is, I have no idea. Probably just so the plot can't have her play back the video file immediately, which sounds extremely out of place given the circumstances of when this show is meant to take place. Other than plot convenience, the fact that Blossom is using a VCR recorder makes absolutely no sense. And okay, like, I get that the episode is trying to be creative with its use of VHS recording by creating a restriction that makes it more difficult for our heroes to prove their innocence. But this is the PPG reboot. This series has ingrained itself in modern times, more than 90% of the shows made in the 2010s. There is no logical reason why Blossom, or anybody for that matter, would be using a VHS recorder for a school project. The Powerpuff Girls reboot has proven it is obsessed with cell phones, social media, streaming, flat screen TVs. Why the hell isn't Blossom using her phone to film this? Or a digital camera? Unless the project was specifically something related to VCR technology or something that took place during the 90s, there's no reason for this. And it's only done for this one episode because, again, they need an excuse for Blossom not to be able to prove the assassination right away. And what gets me most of all is that there has been another episode where she does use a digital camera. Take your kids to Doomsday, the episode where she and her sisters had to do a group project on their parent, the professor, at his job. I appreciate that it tried here, but it makes zero sense in the context of this show. But the problems with this episode do not end there, that's only the beginning. Unfortunately for them, these death ballers never learn the basic skills necessary to judge somebody's innocence because they all take Tess's word for it without questioning a single thing she says and jump to attack the Derbytons without a second thought. Lucky for them, Bobby Sue's Raylan took the hit for them, allowing Blossom and her sisters to fly the rest of them the heck out of there. I guess the reboot decided to continue using this possibly offensive character despite the fact that people had already been addressing that it was problematic by the time season 3 had even entered production. Malin ain't too happy about the girls flying everyone out of there because it made them look like cowards, but her disdain doesn't last long because Blossom tells her that she has the proof they need on VHS tape, suggesting that they find a VHS player as soon as possible so that they can prove their innocence. I'd also like to point out that Malin only blames Blossom, even though we can clearly see that Buttercup and Bubbles helped aid in the escape. It's not fair for Malin to only blame the one that's not on the team. Her teammates are just as guilty here. Lucky for them, the mayor just so happens to be using one of those for his weekly movie event, which conveniently is taking place at this very moment with nobody else but Barry to accompany him. Another thing with the VHS aspect, by the way, it is very fitting for the mayor to have a player, and I'm fully in support of that because he is from a generation that would have more experience with that. But very few children watching this are actually going to understand what that is. And if the episode did something like Teen Titans Go, where it outright explained, hey, this is what a VHS tape was, it's really obscure, haha. I mean, you had to be like a rocket scientist to figure that one out, so they always flash 12. VCRs revolutionize home entertainment. Then I could at least give it a pass, but alas, that does not happen. No problem. We'll just fly 
even be there in a jiffy. No, that's not the death ball way. Forget the death ball way. I'm doing it my way. I can handle Townsville myself. And so could Blossom if she just said screw these guys and went to fix the fucking problem. Malin doesn't want to fly because that's her way? Fine, she's entitled to that. But Blossom has every right to handle the situation the way she wants to do it, considering that she's the one who owns the tape. I could see Blossom making an excuse doing it the death ball way would help her school project, but she doesn't record anything else on tape for the remainder of the episode, so that reasoning is out the window. And if flying isn't permitted, then explain why Buttercup and Bubbles are actually allowed to fly when they play the actual game. We'll be watching tonight's featurette, License to Dill, a tale of a pickle maker and the spy who loves him. How come that movie title is more creative than 95% of the reboot's own episode titles? This is comedy gold, the best part of the episode by far, if only because Barry is in it. Meanwhile, the Derby Taunts are getting attacked by the Kimono Dragons, causing Buttercup and Bubbles to do this ultra team-up move that sends all of those goons packing. You know, as much as I hated Derby Dollies, I'm glad there's at least some continuity, with Bubbles and Buttercup both being members of the Derby Taunts here. And this stunt that they pull off would have been awesome had they done it in some actual crime fighting. Pretty soon, they advance to a nearby diner, where these diner thugs are there waiting for them. Blossom doesn't really understand why they can't just talk to them, so she goes and does just that. Although the Derby Taunts use it as an opportunity for distraction and sneak attack them. <laughs> Why don't you zip up your jacket? Oh yeah! Hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work out for them, and Buttercup has to resort to holding them off so that Malin and Blossom can get to the VHS player before it's too late. Don't worry, old friend. We'll meet again in a better place. Aren't we all going bowling tomorrow? Exactly. All of their team members have gotten picked off at this point except for the two of them. Well, one of them, Blossom's not on the team. And really, this is all Malin's fault because had they just gone about this the proper way, nobody would be hurt right now. But it looks like they're the only ones who can clear the air now. Good news is they do make it to the mayor's screening, but Tess managed to beat them there. Get the tape to the VCR and prove our innocence. Derby times, come out and play. Warriors. Ah uh, yes, another Warriors reference, thank you. As you just saw, Tess just challenged Malin to a one-on-one -on -one battle to settle the score between them, and while Malin does agree to fight, Blossom just scoffs at the idea. Malin's motivations for agreeing to this challenge is because the Death Ball way is her way of life, showing that she's still hell-bent and stubborn on changing out of these ridiculous ways. Which, on one hand, I can kinda get because it's what she taught herself to be used to, it's how she was raised. But at the same time, if there is a better option available, there is nothing wrong with Blossom making it known to her. But the death ball way is my way. You gotta believe in something. And this is it for me. Death ball, death ball. Where the heck did all these people come from? How did they know to meet here? This duel is made out to be greater than it really is. I mean, the fight doesn't last long because Malin just slices Tess's ball in half and stops herself from knocking her out. Hear me, death ball sisters. Death ball is great. We would cost. We've lost too many friends. Too much juice has been spilt. We can't change the rules without changing who we are. Excuse me? What the hell happened to what you just said 30 seconds ago? Who cares about the death ball way? I care. It may be weird. It may be dumb. But the death ball way is my way. You gotta believe in something. Okay, so you argue against Blossom by saying that it's your way and shut her down for not believing in what you believe, but then you go against the very thing you just defended yourself for believing in and reiterating what Blossom believed in. Where did this turnaround come from? This would make more sense if she had a moment prior to this realizing that what Blossom was saying was true, but she doesn't. She chastises her for saying that the death ball way is stupid, and I don't buy this change of mind as a result. Not when she's so headstrong about it up until the moment she's about to tag out Tess. And neither does Tess, who accuses her of stalling just because she was the one who sniped Smashly earlier. But Blossom quickly disproves that thanks to the power of VCR playback technology. 
She's just saying that because she took out Smashly. That's a lie! Huh? And I'll prove it! <laughs> Hang on, just give it a second. There we go. Tess is exposed and she gets pummeled by the cyborg fear leader judge while Malin suggests they implement a new rule that I honestly have no idea what it actually is. Like, Alties are no longer permanent. You can now undo Alties if you tap these twice. Who's with me? The way she says this means absolutely nothing to me. How the hell do you interpret this? Why do all of these words end in Z's? And tap what? Are we tapping the ball to somebody? Are you tagging someone with your hands? Are you tapping the ground? How does this alleviate the problem? Why is this a rule that everyone is just magically okay with if everybody is proven to be headstrong about the fact that Death Ball is grounded in the belief that nothing should ever change? None of this makes any fucking sense. Malin, if you're going to introduce a new rule, you need to be a little more specific regarding the parameters of how this criteria will affect the way the game is played. Shouldn't there be more opposition by literally all of the other characters because the only one that actually went through some kind of change throughout all of this was Malin? Guess that doesn't matter because some undefined amount of time later, the ringleader is back on top and congratulates the debutantes for their expert show of heroism and proceeds to make that initial announcement she had tried to make before being so rudely assassinated. Seriously, how rude. Wash your jerseys, people! It smells worse than a sewer in here. And we're actually in the sewer! And that brings the long skate home to an end. Honestly, I think I'm just gonna come out and say it. I hate Malin. I mean, I seriously detest her. Not as much as Donnie or Jared, but every appearance she has had has been negative. Not just because of her attitude, but because she's been a selfish, unlikable jerk. Not counting her initial appearance. Buttercup versus Math, she treats Buttercup horribly for being a nerd. Derby Dollies, she cuts off Buttercup entirely because Bubbles is a better death ball player. The long skate home, she refuses to listen to reason and gets all of her teammates metaphorically killed. That's what the whole street fights essentially represent. Gangs killing each other, just like in the original movie. And then in Super Sweet Six, she did nothing to help the girls from being attacked by Princess, even though she had already had experience with princess committing an act of injustice against her. I don't enjoy watching her act this way. It's not entertaining. Like, I get the idea of having a code that you live by, but these are just blatantly stupid rules that anybody with half a brain would change. There's no logic behind it. She's just doing it because you gotta believe in something, no matter how preposterous it is. She makes it sound like she's only doing it out of obligation, really. There's no reason to following it at that point. Why even have a code if you're just doing it because that's how it is? Not backing down from a fight is one thing, but banning people from playing your game permanently just because you got tagged by a ball in the hideout where everyone is likely required to meet diplomatically for meetings every so often, when it doesn't matter anywhere else, whether it's on the corner outside of school or in an official match, why did the reboot feel it necessary to make this rule a thing? This should totally be considered a Blossom episode. She's the main character here, alongside Malin, and it really makes me wonder why the title card wasn't painted as such. It seems oddly unfitting considering Buttercup and Bubbles barely do anything at all outside of stalling for time in this episode. Buttercup and Bubbles had a more significant role in Blossom Cubed, and that was considered a Blossom episode. Why wasn't this one? That doesn't make sense to me. Honestly, I personally believe it's a Blossom episode so much that I went ahead and made the thumbnail border a Blossom color because that's what it is. And I'm gonna give Blossom the attention she deserves because the reboot itself won't give it to her. But hey, that's the long skate home.